Okay, so for today's discussion, we'll talk about the user feedback chapter. And um, so we we'll learn basically four things. The first thing is about validation. That is informing a user if the inputs are invalid. Um, secondly, we'll talk about notification, how to create notification. And generally here is sending general message to, messages to user. Um, we'll also discuss progress bars. Um, here, uh, we inform user about progress of time consuming operations. And lastly, about um, confirmation um, or undo. Uh, and this is giving the user a choice and extra security when performing dangerous operations, such as deleting things from the Shiny app. Sorry, um, it's just deleting things. Yeah. The, well, I, what I learned is there's nothing that the user is doing like on the R side, the R script side, but it's best to, in, to provide such. So we'll start with validation. And here will the first section is validating an input. So basically it's giving feedback using the Shiny feedback package, which is created by Andy. And um, so in, we'll do this in two ways. So first, the first thing we'll do is um, in the UI, we add the use, use Shiny feedback function. And as shown in this example, so in the, the fluid page, and then we add this the shiny feedback, we're calling, uh, we're calling this function, this package. And we, our interest is using the use shiny feedback function. And like we learned about the numeric inputs and the text outputs, yeah. And uh, the second thing is now we use either, in the server now, we can use either the feedback function, the feedback warning function, um, the feedback danger or feedback success. And if we look at this example, sorry. Um, so if I run this app, yeah, we see, um, so what this app, first of all, it's doing is the the user inputs a particular figure in it, and then we want to we want to check if it is even. And if it's not an even number, and then there's a function, there's a warning that it will be thrown out that you please select an even number. So let's see that. So for example, if I put one, oh sorry, sorry, no, this is not it. This is for ensuring that the values we have here are positive. So if we put, let's say, negative one, really, then am I choosing, sorry, just a minute to ensure I'm looking at the right. And then we can even look at this example here. Yes, so we have, uh, we have, we input a value, let's say 10. So when it's 10, it divides by two. And then, so uh, if, it, if it's an even number which divided by two, it will give us a particular whole number. But if I input, uh, let's say nine, and then we, um, it's, and message is thrown that please select an even number. And this has been made. This has been made clear by using the rec function. So if we look at, uh, hmm. let's just go back to the notes themselves. Yes, if we look at here, we have put that we want this rec function that it has to be even. And um, the rec, what it what it means, it's the it's required. It's short for required. So this is what we have. So if you select any value that is not an even number, and then you'll get the message that you have to select an even number. Um, and then second, secondly, it's canceling an execution with now the rec function. And what it does is that the rec checks for required values before allowing a reactive producer to continue. And if you don't put the rec, the complete reactive is computed even without the user inputs. And if we look at this example, so we have, we select the language, then you, you put this, the text input. So we have name, and then we have the text output is a greeting. 
And for the greetings, we have two languages. So you choose either English or Maori. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And uh, so once you the, you call the place for the placeholder, um, which has been called in the input, we see that we'll see this particular warning error just because we haven't selected anything. So, but if you select a language and then this error goes. So I had an example of this as well. So let me cancel that and then run this up. Yeah, so we see that this, since we haven't selected any language, which, which is a requirement, we have this, the subscript is out of bound. So that is the error. But if I select English, then I put, let's say, Joki, and then I see that hello Joki. So since I've, select, I've, I've selected a language and I've been input a name, the error has disappeared. You can also do the same by selecting the Maori language, and then you have this. Okay. So we have seen how if we use, uh, um, so if I use, if we use the rec function, so let me just confirm. Yeah, so for this, I had commented out the rec function, but if I uncomment, let me save, then let me run that up again. There is no, uh, the error message. I can go ahead and do what I had done. Oh, yes, Njoki, so hi, hello Njoki, yes. Okay, so that is the use of using a rec function when we haven't selected anything. Therefore, um, sorry, this, this should be an, an error. Therefore, the rec function is designed so that if we put the rec input, the placeholder, for example, x here will continue if the user has applied a value, regardless of the type of input, input control. And I found this to be quite mind, mind blowing. And additionally, we can use the rec function with our own log logical statement. And an example is we don't have to, like how you see here, we put a placeholder. We can also put that this value supplied here has to be greater than zero. And if it's not greater than zero, well, it's, it will still um, don't throw the error, but uh, like there's a condition that it has to be greater. So this A has to be greater than zero. So how about looking at the rec function and validation? So here we have this, we have this particular shiny app where we have the UI. Again, we're using the shiny, we want some feedback. Uh, we want our input to be a data set and then you have to call out a data set name and the table output has to be data. That is the placeholder name that has been given. And if I if we look at here, so here we learn two functions, um, something called exists. So we check if the data set is actually existing. And so if it does not exist, there'll be there'll be this feedback that is a known data set. And if it does exist, and then we have the, the data set will be, we'll see the data set. So I have that example as well. Let me stop this up. Um, yeah, this is it. So if you run this up, so if I type the famous iris data set, you see the iris data set has been um, like the first six, the first six rows have been returned. But if I just type i, and then we, we see a feedback that we have a known data set. Okay. So here, the rec function has been used in two ways. So first of all, it is used to proceed with the computation that the user has entered a value. And this is done by the rec input data set, uh, dollar sign data set. And this is what we see. This is what we see up here in the server. And the second thing what it does, it's then we check to see if the supplied name actually exists. And if it does not, and then we see the displayed message. And we use the rec to cancel any computation. 
So um, this is a note that the use of the cancel output is equal to true. This is normally cancels a reactive with, sorry, canceling a reactive will reset all the downstream outputs. And using again this, it will leave leaves them displaying the last good value. So this is very important for text inputs, which may trigger an update while you're using, while, while you are in the middle of typing a name. Yeah, like what you have seen. So we have, whatever that I've just shown, it's this example in this app. And so the, the last thing in the validating, um, in the validating is now we validate an output. And this is done when suppose that you have an invalid state is as a result of a combination of inputs. We cannot know where the error has come from because we have several inputs. So what it would make sense to have to put it in the outputs. And we do so by doing the validate um, into brackets message. And this will stop the execution of the rest of the code. Instead, displays any um, displays message in any um, of the downstream outputs. So if we look at this example, so let's just look at the code. The UI, it's like what we have. So here we have choices that you have to choose either a square, a log or square root. And we do the validate. So message is equals to, um, X cannot be a negative for this transformation. And we can also switch, we can also switch. So what I understood with this switch function is that it is switching between the three. So you can switch to have uh, the square, you can have the square root or you can have it as a uh, log. And this is what is displayed here. So if you choose zero, um, if you look at and you choose particular square, of course the square over zero is zero. So a zero will be returned. But if you have a negative one, and then we choose, um, I choose, we choose particularly the log, we want to say the log of negative one, then we see that X cannot be a negative for this transformation. I am not so sure if I have it, so let's see if I, yeah. So if we run this up, let's just do it and see. So we have zero result has been, that's, that is what we're saying if you don't put anything. And if I put negative two, for example, we see that for square negative two times negative two times negative two becomes a positive. So that's why you have negative the four here. But if we choose a square root, we know that uh, we, we can never find square roots of a negative value usually. So that is where we have X cannot be negative for this particular transformation as what we had supplied as the error message to be thrown in case that happens. Okay, uh, there's a text. Can I use this technique, re and validate to limit the ranges of my user inputs? For example, numeric inputs between allowable ranges. Oh, uh, that is a good question, but I have no idea. <laughs> Marianne, can you come in and help me? Yeah, sure can. Let me reread this real quick, Chris. To limit the ranges of my user inputs, for instance, numeric inputs between, if you were to incorporate some level of if logic, so the data input that the receiver is sending to you, you can manage that information and validate whether or not the input that they're providing you is accurate or not. Um, if it does not match your logical if statement, uh, then you can uh, send that user feedback uh, back to the to the shiny app, uh, so the the individual doesn't feel like they're they're uh, lobbing information into the void and not getting any response from your server. the The user feedback concepts or this this rec concept is nothing more than a requirement saying, I need to make sure that this is accurate. If it is not, then I will provide some level of feedback to the user. Does that answer your question, Chris? Your, yes. your, your comment says about numeric input ranges. Um, yes, you can provide a range of input. Um, I think it's the range function, but let me double check that. So if you're, if you're wanting a, a, a scalar or some form of, of data saying, you know, I want it to be greater than 10, but less than 50, you can limit that range between 10 and, and 50 
and that's the only allowable input, that would be what that if uh, statement would uh, provide. You're just forming that logic around uh, that particular input value. If it's less than 10, I'm going to give you an error. If it's greater than 50, I'm going to give you an error. I hope that that gives you a little bit more context. I'll get you the, I'll, I'll find the function that would provide us that particular range, if that would help. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we can move to the next uh, section, which is no notification. So we use the function show notification if there is no problem, but we want to show the user what is happening. The user is not left to know if there's something that is happening or not. And we can do this in three ways. So we can show a trans transient uh, notification that auto automatically disappears after a fixed amount of time. Or we can show a notification when a process starts and removes it when the process ends. And lastly, we can update a single notification with progress updates. So the first one on the transient notification. So we use the function again, show notification with a single argument. And the message that you want to display, um, the message you want to display the message that you want to display. And this, would be that this is the simplest way to show a notification. So for example, here we have uh, the UI and the action by is good night. And we want to, so here the, I think, so, so, so long, farewell, um, this and this. So um, let's, we can look at an example of that. Should printer, okay, I can just go back. If you look at the sonification, they come build, uh, the very bottom right, at the right bottom. So if you do good night, you'll see so long, farewell, uh, that and this. And a user can simply just, if you want to cancel, you can simply cancel or by default, they'll disappear after a couple of seconds. Okay. Um, so by default, the message will disappear after five seconds, but you can override that particular setting using the duration arguments, or the user can simply just dismiss it earlier by clicking the close button on the X. And uh, suppose we want to make the notification more prominent, we can set the type argument to be one of the following. So it can either be a message, so it will be displayed blue, and then it can, it can be a warning, which will be displayed, I think a version of brown, I'm not so sure the color, but the other one, if it's an error, then we'll see um, red. So if we open this, um, so if we click again, the good night, let's, so, so long the notification is probably it's just black and then farewell, it being a message will be blue. And then the warning will be the, a version of brown, I think. And the last one, which is a warning, it will be a red color. So that is why I manipulated the colors to have this. Um, the other thing is no removing on completion. So here we want the, the notification to start when the task starts and the notification to be removed when the task is completed. So we can do so doing uh, doing two things. So first of all, you set the duration is equals to null and uh, the close button also is equals to false. And this allows the notification to stay visible until the task is complete. Or we can store the ID returned by, uh, by the show notification function and then pass this value to remove notification and or using the on the on dot of exit exist exit, sorry, function. And this is what we see here in the server. So we have, we have uh, our, reactive, our reactive function. Then we have to put an ID that to show notification. So here it will read the data, reading the data. Um, and then remember I've been told that we need to put the duration is close to null and the close button is equals to false. Uh, or we can use the on exit on exit and here it will remove notification for this ID. So we have also the show notification and the add is equals to true. So if we look at um, this app, 
So I, 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 I don't know if you've seen something. Let me try to load this again. If it's reading data, yes, there's some uh, stuff, <laughs> wordings that are coming on the very below, um, on the right bottom. And we see this, the MPG data set is loaded. So that is just another way of removing on completion. So the as the data is being as the data is loading, we see some notifications here. And once it's done loading, and we see the data sets, and then the notifications have disappeared. Um, and we can also have the progressive updates. And so, firstly, if we call multiple times, uh, they show notification and then it will show multiple notification. Or we can use an ID where we capture it from the first call and then we use it in subsequent calls. So let's look at that. So we have the UI, which is the table outputs uh, data. Um, so for the server, we have, we have a notify message, a notify, which is a function. Here we have a message and an ID is equals to null. So we are inputting that ID instead of calling it several times. And then we use the show notification ID is equals to ID. And then the duration is equals to null and a close button is equals to false. And if we look at this, the reactive function, we see that the ID is equals to notify. This is when we're reading the data. Then we have, we also notify, we'll see the reticulating splines and we'll see another one, um, hiding phylamas, <laughs> I think. And ID is equals to ID. So we have already, instead of keeping, so instead of doing like what you have done um, previously, we can just put an ID and then call that ID in the all the calls that you want to be, all the uh, notification messages that they want to be displayed. Yeah, so this is the same as what you have seen above. Um, but what we see here is we are calling an ID that will be called several times. I see something on the chat. Okay, uh, this is friend explaining. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we can then now move to the third section, which was on progress bars. So this is good when you are doing long run, long running tasks. So here we need to be able to divide. So to do this, we need to be able to divide the big task into known number of small pieces that each take roughly the same amount of time. And we can do this using uh, three packages. So there is the shiny, which is like the inbuilt function. Um, inbuilt function, the shiny package. There is the waiter package. And uh, lastly, the spinners, which is also part of the waiters package. So for firstly, using the inbuilt function, we use the with progress and the ink uh, progress functions. So uh, UI, it's like uh, what we had before, just the normal UI that we know. So for the server, we have to input that with progress package. So uh, the message will, the message that will be displayed is computing a random a random number. Um, we have to input the for function. So here, the for function, I. So what we see here in the for function is that we want i in the sec length input um, dollar sign steps. Did anyone understand what exactly this for the for loop is doing here? They tried understanding, but I think I'm lost. I, I can try, I think uh, I haven't, yeah. yeah, I can try. So maybe, so what I'm, uh, what I'm, what I'm just seeing from the, like the for loop. Uh, so it's looping uh, uh, across the, the length of the steps. For example, if it's uh, maybe 10 steps or 15 steps. So it's looping through each of them. And uh, I think what they need, in include progress function does is to just find like a, a fraction 
of, uh, I mean, the eight steps. I don't know whether that's correct. So, for example, if it's uh, maybe in, uh, in, in loop number five, then it will report that as a fraction of, 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 the, of, the, of the total step that it needs to loop over. So, yeah, that's what I understood from the, that course sniper. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and then there is now the ink progress function. So this, the first argument here one, it is the amount of incre the amount to increment the progress bar. And by default, this bar starts at zero and it ends at one. So the incrementing by one divided by the number of steps does ensure the progress bar is complete at the end of the loop. Okay, so we can look at that example here. Let's close this. Okay. So, so we have 10 and if, so 10 is what is being displayed without the user doing anything. And if we click the action bar, because we have computing the random number, that is the message. And then it will return so it will return this 0 0.32, which is the random number. And this random number we see it has been generated from the R uniform distribution, sorry, from the distri uniform distribution using the R uniform function. Yeah. Um, so note that the optional message argument is used to add some explanatory text to the progress bar. Like we see here, a message is equals to computing the random number, as we've seen. And the, uh, the system.slip function is used to simulate a long running operation. Um, in your code, this would be slow. This will be a slow function. What is a slow function? <laughs> I would think anything that's uh, uh, CPU intensive or networking intensive. Uh, something that you're you're processing a lot of information. So a slow running service would be anything of large. Um, that's obviously relative to what device you're working on or how you're interacting with it. Okay, thank you. And thirdly, is the user can control when the event starts by combining a button with event reactive. So this is a good practice for any task that requires a progress bar. So instead of using the inbuilt function, we can use other functions. And um, here we look at the package waiter. And this provides more visual options compared to the built-in um, progress bar. So the, this waiter package uses the R6 objects. And what it does, it, it bundles all the progress-related function into a single object. So we see, first of all, we first of all start by right in the UI, we use the wait term, um, the function use waitress function. And then we also do this, we also have to put, create a new progress bar using the waitress um, dollar new. And then the maximum should be the input, should be the number of steps, the input number of steps that you have in the numeric inputs. And so if you want to automatically close it when it's done, we use the on.exit exit function, as you've seen. And then so we pull um, this, the waitress dollars and close, and it will automatically close it after the, the task is done. And like we have, we have been explained for above, um, this is the for loop. And instead of using the inbuilt function, we, we, the ink progress, we'll use the waitress ink so here we are, incre we are increasing by one step. And then we calculate with uh, the resulting will be the random number, uh, which is from a uniform distribution. So let's have an example of this and see. So we have this, please wait. Yeah, I think that was it. I, I tried understanding what exactly is happening here, but in my understanding, the please wait was, sorry, the please wait was, okay, cannot do that. 
Um, so let me just open again. Ah, no. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I meant to look at the waiter. Yeah. Uh, yes, this app. Was this it that this is what we are seeing? Oh, wow. The progress bars. I think that was meant, that is what we're meant to see. Um, so if we wish to change the default theme, so we have seen that it is grayish. So if we wish to change that default theme, we can use either the overlay, um, which is an opaque progress bar that hides the whole page, or we can use the overlay opacity, op sorry, yeah, opacity, which is a translucent progress bar that covers the whole page, or we can use the overlay percent. And this is an opaque progress bar that also displays a numeric percentage. Um, additionally, instead of showing a progress bar for the entire page, uh, you can overlay it with an existing input or output by, se by setting the selector parameter. This was the example that was given. So we have the waitress, um, the waitress dollar sign new, and then so we have the selector is equals to step, and then the theme is overlay. But I, I, I didn't try this. Uh, please go ahead and try it on your own. So we have seen about the progress bar. So what if we want to see the circle, the spinning thing? So suppose you do not know how long exactly an operation is taking. You just want to display an animated spinner. And this will reassure the user that something is actually happening. So that is why I use the spinners. So for the spinners, it also use, we, we, we create spinners using the waiter package, but instead of using the waitress as we're doing, we use waiter. So the UI, um, in the UI uh, and in the fluid page, we again use the waiter, um, the waiter use underscore waiter function. But here is what it changed. Instead of using you know, the waitress, we now use the waiter. This, this is what has deferred. And if we load this up, yes. and if we say go, yeah, see it's spinning. So instead of having the progress buzz, and then we have the spinning thing. Okay. Um, so you can use the waiter for specific outputs, which will make, uh, for specific outputs, which will make the code simpler. So for example, here we have the waiter uh, new, so we have an ID is equals to plot as what we had. Uh, we had in the plot output, the placeholder to also be the ID is equals to plot. And then we have dollar sign is equals to show. And if we check this particular app, so if I click go, it shows like half that. Yes, and now we see this particular plot before the plot is being generated. So additionally, there's a simpler alternative to use, which is the Shiny CSS Loaders um, package, which was developed by Dean. And this uses a JavaScript to listen to Shiny events. So it doesn't need any code on the server side. So it's just on the UI. So we use this, this with spinner function from this shiny CSS loaders. And what this does is to wrap the outputs that you want to automatically get a spinner when they have been invalidated. And this was the example. This was the example. Any question? I, okay. Let me ask you more question. So the next section is confirming and undoing. And this is done for potentially dangerous actions, actions like deleting things. So firstly, about the explicit confirmation. 
In this, we create a dialog box using the modal dialog function. And this function is called modal dialog because it will create a new mode of interaction. That is, you cannot interact with the main application until you've dealt with the dialog. If you look at uh, this particular, um, so we have the mod, the modal dialog. You asked, I, so this is what will be displayed that are you sure you want to continue? So the title here is it's deleting files. The title of the dialog here, you see it's deleting files. And then for the footer is now we have a tag list function. And here we have got two action bars, action buttons, sorry. So the firstly is canceling or uh, the other thing, the, the other action button is okay. That is you delete it. And you see that it is, I think this particular class results to it being red like a different colors compared to the rest. Um, so this is the, the shiny app as an example. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure if. Um, so chapter eight. See if there is a live one that you can look at. Mm -hmm. there, is, there isn't a live one, but I, I hope it makes sense. <laughs> so the other thing is now I'm doing an action. So um, this is more like waiting some time before actually performing the task and giving the user time to stop the action before it's actually happening. And if we look at this example, so this was the example, um, this, this particular section was relating, uh, the author related it to, to Twitter. Like for example, if you, uh, put a typo or grammatical errors. And you see, if you tweet, the, you cannot edit that particular tweet. All you have to do is delete it. So here, let's say, sunny. It's a sunny day. So I say tweets. And if I tweet here, if I see down here, tweeted, it's a sunny day. Oh, sorry. You can undo. Let's just do that. It's a sunny day. So if I tweet and then you have to quickly and say, I want to undo that so that I can be able to see, let me add my exclamation mark to show you how it's a sunny day. And if I put, uh, if I click tweet and then we see that it has been tweeted already. And this is never the case when it comes to the Twitter social media. Okay. Um, so the last thing was about trash. And in this particular section, subsection, the author didn't prove, this is just for us to know that there's this option, but there's not any illustration that was done. So creating trash or recycling bin on your computer so that when you delete a file, it isn't permanently deleted, but instead you move it to a holding cell, which requires a separate action to empty. So this is similar to what you have seen, the undo option, but on steroids. You have a lot of time to regret your action. So it is also a bit like the confirmation, you have to do two separate actions to make the deletion permanent. Because now you, you send it to a trash and then from the trash and then you delete it permanently. However, there is a disadvantage of using this particular technique. So first of all, it is substantially more complicated to implement it because you have to have a separate holding cell that will store the information needed to do, to, to do the undo action. And also it requires a regular intervention from the user to avoid accumulating. Um, has, I would want to know if anyone has ever tried this or anyone has an idea of how this goes about. I've never heard of it. This was actually my first time hearing of it. <laughs> I was going to add a 
Yeah, I was going to add a comment to this. So a lot of the times when we are reading the text as written by Mr. Wickham and the team putting together the documentation for Shiny, the, the term holding cell, it, there's no holding cell. What you're doing, that's, a, that's an alias or a definition for just a temp space. So you're creating this temporary environment, this temporary uh, uh, object where you're you're populating the content that the user has deleted now with that temporary space you have to do a double option to say okay are you confirming that you do want to delete this so it's it's the first stage is like throwing it in your recycling bin right so the recycling bin will live forever it's just memory dedicated to holding this content that you don't want anymore now you can go back in and resurrect it if you would like you can pull it back out of the recycling bin in the case of the Shiny app, and because the timing, right, this reactive calls and all the, the nuance of HTML in general is all very ephemeral. It's, it's, it's just in the time that you are interacting with the app. So this temp memory space that we're referring to, if the user says, I want to delete that data, you can put that into this, this holding cell, we'll call it, uh, where it's not going to, it's not going to take any action yet. Now you could have it as, you know, on exit, delete, anything that you had in that temporary space. So the server's not uh, getting, you know, a whole bunch of users just putting crap in there. And then, yeah, the, 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 the uh, server runs out of memory um, or it's, it's uh, a second activity where the user says, yes, I, I am confirming, I do want to delete this. And so once it's out of that temp space, it's gone. It's completely deleted. The, the memory space that was previously allocated is no longer there. There's no pointer for it. So therefore it doesn't exist. Does that help? Yes. yes. The, the, the trash idea uh, is, is just that it's like a recycling bin and, and it does take that extra step because you are providing another separate uh, process in which you're creating that memory space in storage where that temporary data goes. I'm always careful about some of the definitions terms that they use um, that they'll, they'll we'll call it something and then everyone gets triggered on that one comment and that that's not accurate in essence, this is what it's doing. Uh, and so uh, helping to define that or kind of think of the computer in, in logical form, um, it's only gonna do what you're telling it to do or what the instructions tell it to do. So anyway. Okay, uh, thank you for that input. I did, want, I did want to jump in real quick, if you don't mind, Lucy. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. I provided a link to uh, the Bootstrap modal um, dialogue box. So the reason this is important, you can add in the CSS and, and layout chapter six, uh, we talked about bootstrap content coming back into Shiny uh, because it's just HTML5. You just need to know how to access it. In the example that you had, it was, uh, I think it was button, uh, class button, and then I think it was button warning uh, or but, but, button danger. Um, there's a whole bunch of options that you have with those button calls. If you don't mind scrolling up just one section, uh, there we go. You can stay right there. So the second line of text on the screen where it says action button, okay, delete class button, and then the, um, the CSS value that you're giving it is the button danger. And that's what gives you that red. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the phrase, so first thing is the okay is going to be the, the uh, ID for that. Anything in that first, um, uh, comma separated line of text, the okay is going to be your, your ID. Uh, the delete is the text that you're going to see on that button itself. So the, the, the word is delete. If you were to change that, it could be anything, right? You could change it to nuke and, and, you know, get rid of it. And in the class, we're calling on the button class within the CSS to create that uh, squared rounded edge uh, form. And then button danger is putting the red uh, background color with the white font on top. And what I was trying to take everyone towards is in that bootstrap modal link that I just added, uh, there's button primary, secondary, success, danger, warning, info, light, and dark. So those are all options that you could change with our Shiny app calling on the modal class, which has all of these features built into it. Shiny itself, or the art, uh, the, the shiny package itself doesn't necessarily uh, have these directly in their own script. You're bootstrapping, you're adding on additional features by calling on the uh, uh, BS lib uh, to incorporate those. 
additional activities. Does that help? Yes, thank you for the clarification. That you bet, help. you bet. Oh, okay, and uh, to finish up the chapter, so this is just a summary of what you have learned. So you have learned a number of tools that have helped us, that help us to communicate to the user what is happening with our app. Secondly, we have learned this, and these techniques are mostly optional. So that means that your work, your app can work with or without them, uh, and their thoughtful application can have a huge impact on the quality of the user experience. And lastly, if you are the only user, then there's no need to have a feedback because you're the only user here. Yeah. But the more people are using it, the more thoughtful uh, a notification will pay off. And then I did put a smiley face to share. That's actually a very good thing to do. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has a comment or a question. I, it was a very short uh, chapter, but it was quite insightful. I honestly didn't know that, yeah, you have to care about the user experience when it comes to your shiny apps. Yeah, I was just creating shiny apps and like assuming that my user will understand what is happening. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, just uh, to put a comment through here. So this has uh, been very, uh, I mean, enlightening because I I've seen some shiny apps uh, come across some shiny apps where uh, relating to the question I ask about uh, numeric inputs, trying to like make sure that uh, if your numeric input range ranges between say three to ten, so then if if a user puts uh, a value that is outside that range, then execution does not happen. So I've seen some some apps created that way, but they were explaining uh, something to do with the, I think modules, which is far ahead of the chapters. And I'm very happy to learn that uh, you can actually use REC and validation to actually achieve the same goal uh, as the ones that I've seen in other apps being uh, being done using uh, modules. So I'm happy, I'm happy about this session. I've, I've really learned something. Thank you. Lucy, I was gonna add, no, Christopher, that's a, a great comment uh, in the, uh, cohort number two, Kevin was the individual, I believe, that gave this chapter and the use case that he was discussing with feedback, that uh, trash uh, comment of, you know, the holding cell, do you want to delete this concept? In his development environment, he had a database where all of the, the data lived and he was using Shiny as a front end to manipulate the queries that were calling on those databases to pull them forward. And there were tendencies of the user that um, he had options where you could actually delete data in the database. And that's never a good thing. You're just going to start breaking stuff. And so um, he goes in an early uh, instance of that release, uh, when he was deleting data, he constantly had to go back in and back up information, et cetera. So he created these uh, additional, um, we'll call them speed bumps or, or areas where the user right? Any person that's connecting to his app uh, and then accessing this database of all this media, it wasn't able to delete anything. And so he, he uh, throughout this whole chapter, he was smiling uh, in, in most case, because he goes, I, I actually had to work and try to figure out how to uh, put those restrictions on the, the user interacting with the database. I want it to be read only. Um, Christopher, in your comment of date, uh, data ranges, one of the biggest uh, conflicts we have from a web development perspective, having a server in the in the you know world of the internet uh, and users interacting with it, we don't know what they're going to do, right? And so if you open up any vulnerabilities, any points where they could um, kind of like stack overflow, right? They're, they're breaking the normal logic of your Shiny app, they could potentially take over the server. And that's a whole other uh, security detail, et cetera. But this chapter provides a lot of interaction so that you can at least provide the user some some feedback saying yes i am doing something i meaning the server i am processing something i am doing something and with these tools with these packages with these instructions we can provide that user a feedback that says hey can you wait just a little bit longer let me process this large data set uh, or uh, you know i'm i'm waiting on my network call as the reactive is rebuilding and, and populating these these uh, output points 
So yeah, the feedback is just a nice way for you to uh, allow the user to have a good feeling that you know what you're interacting with is not uh, unresponsive. You are at least working on something. And I, I know I'm putting myself in a first person perspective when I'm saying, you know, I meaning the server and then the, the user, whoever they may be. Anyway. Okay, uh, thank you both for the comments here yeah, and also for contributing to the discussion. Um, so our next topic is the uploads and downloads, but at the moment we don't have anyone who has um, registered to lead that discussion. So if a uh, Tuesday no one will have registered, uh, Ren and I will discuss to know who will who will um, present that particular discussion. And I volunteer. Yes, yes, please. Um, so we have a sign sheets. Okay. Sign up sheets. Yeah. Let me... I was going to say, Christopher, I, I'm assuming you've got to the Zoom link uh, to join the meeting, but um, on Slack at the very top row of the Mastering Shiny uh, thread, uh, there'll be a, a cohort three sign up. Uh, Lucy, I think, okay. is going to show that real quick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I, this is my, my first session, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm glad. I'm, I'm. I'm happy to also uh, like uh, lead the next topic. So yeah. So I'll shine. I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll de definitely put up my name on the on the sheet. And and Christopher and and to any of the users that may be watching this uh, at a later point in time, most of our staff. Sorry, not staff. Let me rephrase that. Most of the team members. Uh, we're all volunteers, but we are uh, in that learning community in that Slack thread. Uh, so anytime you're searching for anybody, um, if you're, uh, I think on Zoom, whatever our names are show up uh, as we're speaking, but uh, you can search that in there or um, specifically to Shiny, there is a chat thread where it's talking, you know, if you have any questions about Shiny development, et cetera, you can post questions into that. There are mentors, there are other users that can jump in and, and possibly help guide answering that question or, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, my favorite thing to do is I'll jump on Zoom with somebody and actually interact with them uh, to answer their question or, or uh, sign off check mark. Uh, I think Frederica has done that before as well, um, answering users' questions. It's a very responsive system. Sure. Thanks. Um, with respect to upload and download, so um, I didn't mean to jump in, Lucy, I apologize, you were going to comment. The upload and download concept, the comment I made about security, that security comment is, is, a, is kind of an undertone of that entire chapter, um, because you don't want to upload malicious data to a server. So there's going to be checks and balances that we're going to follow. Um, some of it gets into some regex and, and some other um, and wrappers of data input, so it, uh, validation points, it might also answer your question about the uh, num numeric ranges. Um, so feel welcome to post anything or, or ping anybody. Um, I can jump in and give you a little bit more guidance about that if needed. Okay, thanks. Awesome, uh, thank you uh, all uh, for the discussion and for joining us. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Chris, uh, thank you for taking the lead. Uh, for the next chapter in that we will see i will see you next week i wish you a good day a morning evening depending on where you are uh, bye see you next week bye